my name is Melinda Hall, and I am here before you now because of my role with the Brown Center. And I am very glad to introduce my friend and colleague, Dr. Alan Green, to present on um, his sabbatical research today. Um, and so, yeah, I'd love to turn it over to him to get started on his presentation. Thank you, Melinda, uh, and thank you all for being here. So, quick overview before I jump in. Um, my sabbatical project is um, to try and write a book, <laughs> was to try and write a book. Uh, and what I'll be presenting is a broad overview of, of that project. Um, and it's still in pretty early stages. Um, so that's why you're going to get kind of a broad overview and then I'll focus in on a couple areas where I'd really like to get some feedback. Um, and I'm glad we have some uh, one other economist and then some non-economist in the room um, to help me with that feedback because this would be a book kind of um, targeted, I guess, at an entry level uh, undergraduate audience. Um, so with that, let me share a presentation here and go ahead and get started. Um, and also, we'll just emphasize we've got a nice small group. Uh, so feel free to ask questions throughout. Um, and I'll ask for feedback uh, at various points as well. Um, because this is very much uh, a working title and a working project. Um, and it will help me to get more feedback rather than less. So, all right, the working title, Capitalism, Democracy, and Progress. Um, if you don't know this about me, you will figure it out soon. I like to think big, um, kind of look at the big picture, and that's really what this is trying to do. Uh, it's really, the basic idea is an economic history from the perspective of an average person, um, what life is like. So looking at life expectancy, uh, what people could expect in terms of work, what education they might have, uh, what degree of health, health care, uh, safety, freedom, just again, trying to look fairly broadly at well-being for um, an average person. Uh, as I'll discuss in a minute, a lot of history seems to end up somewhat understandably, you know, focusing on uh, the drama and the kings and the queens and the wars and the plagues. Um, and this is intended to be a little different, right? Um, to ask, well, what's what's life like for the regular person, right? Okay, so to give you the broad overview, um, I'm going to use one of my favorite visualizations, which, okay, not actually technically my visualization, but a uh, an excellent one that is online. So this is a website called Gapminder. Um, and what we'll do here, we'll drag this back to the beginning. So what this is showing, we have life expectancy on our vertical axis here, right? Every dot represents a country. So I can hover over uh, and you can see, right? Um, so the red dot there would be China, right? Okay. The size of the dot represents the size of the population of that country. Okay. And then it's plotted on the axis here with life expectancy on the vertical. So average life expectancy in that country and then income per person. Um, and you can see in the chart there, if you look, that's so GDP per capita per person, right? Um, that's purchasing power parity, inflation adjusted. That's just economists saying they've done the best they can to compare this across countries and over time, right? So we start in the year 1800, and this little dot here is Iraq. Interestingly, surprisingly, with the highest income per person uh, in the world in 1800 at $3,840. Um, that should seem like a little because it is, right? And this one I love, the highest life expectancy in the world, 1800, was found in Iceland. So I'm trying to hover there. It doesn't quite want to hold it. Let's see. Yeah, it's too small to even try to hold it. Uh, but Iceland with a life expectancy at a, uh, an amazing 43 years, even with an income per person less than $1,000, um, and that's the highest life expectancy that we see, 
right? So we start at 1800. Um, that's because things start to change in 1800. But you can go back prior to 1800, and you're not going to find really any country, region, area uh, for any substantial period of time that exceeded income of, of $4,000 per person or life expectancy of, of 43 or 44 for any substantial period of time. Um, the way we say this in economics is economic history really starts in 1800. Um, everything before that is actually, in terms of what I'm looking at for average, the average person, it's pretty dismal and pretty um, boring in a sense, right? Okay. So what this uh, visualization will do is show you the change, right? You basically have every country in the world with life expectancy below 40 and income below $4,000 in the year 1800. And then this will go through time and we can watch the moving dots, right? And you'll notice they're colored by region. And so you see Europe starting to take off here uh, in terms of income growth and then life expectancy creeping up, right? Um, and then that little green dot there is the United States that's getting bigger as its population is growing, right? And income rising. Um, and the rest of the world not moving up yet. I want to pause for a second because you might have missed it, but there's a big blip, right? 1920, 1919. Oh, there it was. Huge blip in life expectancy. That was the Spanish flu, the last major global pandemic. Um, so interesting to note that its effects were seen worldwide. Hopefully, we don't have as big a blip from COVID, but there will assuredly be some. And I'll pause here for a second. Just by 1964, post-World War II, massive increases already in life expectancy and income. Um, but we're starting to see the developing world catch up first in life expectancy. Uh, and then in, term of, in terms of income, it's coming. Um, and watch China kind of here in the last 40 years, we'll see a rapid increase in income per person. Um, So we move this up and we get, you know, caught up with the most recent data. And now the worst life expectancy we can find in the world would be in the Central African Republic at 53 years. Uh, but almost every country is over 60. And while con some countries are still quite poor, right, we can find Congo and Somalia there below $1,000 per person, um, the majority of the world's population is over $4,000 a person. And remember, that was no country had income per person higher than that before 1800. So that's the broad picture is there's been incredible change, right, um, in terms of the well-being, well, in a sense, right, average income and life expectancy of the average person. It doesn't start until the Industrial Revolution. Um, and then it's very rapid since then. Okay, so that's the broad context. Here are some of the questions I want to ask. Um, and I'd actually like to ask everybody here, if you wouldn't mind, to consider these for a minute. Right? But the question is, um, in a good society, right, if we're, you know, imagining, imagining kind of theoretically here, what, what would it look like? right? Um, what would you expect to exist? What would you expect to be present, right? And I mentioned stable prices. That probably wasn't your first thought, but, you know, that's where an economist goes. Um, we probably do want some sort of stable prices. Uh, and then kind of go down, right? Um, so defined property rights and contract enforcement, uh, basic public goods, right? Um, then we get to the concept of full employment, which means basically every person who is able and desires to work is able to find a job. Um, and then we have this notion, number five, of economic stabilization, right? And so uh, I mentioned that as something that we might see. Um, a pandemic would be another. Uh, but more common in economics now, we talk about the business cycle and recessions, right? And what actions do we expect to stabilize the economy? 
Uh, and then we can get down to some notions of universal health care or uh, universal basic income. So if you wouldn't mind if you're here, um, maybe just type numbers in the chat, right, of which ones of these would you expect to see in a good society? Um, so yeah, take a second there, give me some feedback. Uh, or if you know if you think there are things that I'm missing, add those in as well. <laughs> um, doesn't have to be a priority order, but feel free if that um, seems worth it. <laughs> Kushbu, I'm very interested that the uh, other economist left out <laughs> the uh, standard economic goals. Uh, right. Um, so I was still typing, but I guess I sent my first ranking. Um, I yeah, I, I think stable prices would follow if we followed two to seven. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> well, Tom, we'll return to the question multiple times if that helps. Uh, <laughs> so, so consider this a first take at uh, what you expect. Um, and then what I'd like to do is go back and kind of look at what's possible, what, what was possible at various times, um, and come back and see. So interesting. OK. OK. No, thank you all. Um, interesting to see. So this is an exercise I take my students through um, and uh, the Kind of history of globalization class that we teach um, to think about and ask them to consider it at various points in time, right? Okay, so let me turn now to kind of the broad story of this project, right? Um, <laughs> Tom, that's exactly right. So I want to go back to kind of explaining you know, in the pre-industrial world, why there was no widespread prosperity, right? Um, and then how it changed. I mean, that has to be the first part of the story, right? Of how do we get to a modern era um, where there is much greater prosperity? Um, so we first have to understand what changed. And the story there is most of the population in the pre-industrial world worked in agriculture, most everywhere. Um, and more importantly, there's, there's two key basic concepts. And the first is just surplus, meaning if we look at, um, you know, a farmer, um, which most people were, right, how much are they able to produce? Um, and what we would see is a decent rough estimate might be twice what they need, twice the subsistence amount of food, right? Initially, that sounds pretty good, okay, but the subsistence level is really pretty low, was the first thing to understand. Um, next would be that trading was rather limited, and so there were markets. We can find markets throughout history, um, but in most times and places, they'd be pretty limited in terms of variety um, and limited by how connected areas were to one another. So the first concept there is just surplus production, right? Uh, but understand that for humanity to survive and um, for populations to grow, right? For, uh, you know, empires to rise and fall, there has to be some surplus, right? Our, our basic average worker has to be able to produce more than what they need. Well, because obviously you have some kings and queens, uh, emperors, uh, whoever, who are not directly producing things, right? But who are, who are capturing some of that surplus. So we have some surplus. And that leads into the second part, which is there are power dynamics. And we want to acknowledge that from the beginning. Um, and so simply put, no one gets to keep all the fruits of their labor, uh, period. 
Um, sometimes even today, uh, we'll hear this kind of you know, libertarian notion, right, that um, well, the fun statement of it is taxation is theft, right? Um, you know, and the notion behind that is, you know, if people work, well, of course they should get to capture all the benefit of, of what they produce, right? Uh, the reality is that uh, just about never happens uh, and it really hasn't happened historically. Um, the way we think about it in terms of, uh, this is really actually game theory, which is a, a related to economics, but also related to other fields, right? Um, but there are th basically three games we can imagine talking about these power structures. The first, uh, a dictator game is named that because it assumes that you basically have a dictator. In other words, you'd have a, a peasant farmer or a kind of average person, uh, and they would have um, a chief or a lord or a noble who uh, basically tells that farmer, how much of their production they get to keep and how much the dictator is going to take and the farmer has no other option and what we would expect to see in such a game is well the dictator is going to take most of it because that's the dictator's uh, prerogative right and that is a power structure that we can actually observe uh, then historically right we can kind of match up times and places to that the second option would be an ultimatum game it's pretty similar but it adds in one little little bit of a bit of agency, I guess, to the peasant farmer. And that is they have the ability to say no. And so in an ultimatum game, one side makes a proposal, right? And so we think of this as a peasant produces, you know, twice what they need to survive. And then, you know, their Lord says, okay, I propose that I take 80% of the extra and you keep 20%. And if it's an ultimatum game, the peasant could actually say no, right? Of course, they wouldn't be allowed to make a counteroffer. Uh, they might <laughs> face some punishment. They might not have much of an outside option. Um, so it's not much more power, but just that distinction uh, does allow for peasants to keep a little bit more of their surplus, right? Um, so in a dictator game, the peasant might keep kind of zero to five percent of their surplus, just a minimal amount. It's an ultimatum game. They might get a little more, right? Maybe ten percent. OK, the last concept will be actual bargaining. Um, and this is what you'd expect to see among equal players. Uh, and so if the peasants were able to, you know, organize, right, uh, scare their lord or chief or whatever into, um, you know, actually negotiating with them as equals, then we get some type of bargaining. Um, and there, if if they're actually negotiating on an equal level, they might get a 50-50 split, okay? What we come away from this saying is the best people could hope for, especially in the pre-industrial period, is that they might get to keep half of their surplus production, right? And the other half is going to be taken by whoever is in power, okay? That's our basic starting point. Um, and the bargaining game there, while it's the best power structure for um, kind of the average person is probably the rarest in terms of what we actually see, right? So most uh, societies in the pre-industrial period were not organized um, in around any form of equality. They were more organized in the form of hierarchy with some kind of uh, dictator or ultimatum notion. Okay, so to summarize, before 1800, um, every economy, every society was governed by Malthusian constraints. Um, so Thomas Malthus deserves a little um, actual praise here. And you may uh, or may or may not have heard of Malthus. Um, if you have heard of Malthus, it was probably in the context of uh, you know, predicting overpopulation and all sorts of dismal outcomes that would follow. Um, and the way Malthus is largely treated in economics these days is he might get mentioned in an introductory textbook, but only to say that, oh, Malthus was wrong because look at the post-industrial period. Let me explain why that's really not fair to Malthus. Malthus was writing in the early 1800s, and he basically said, 
any improvements in production that would probably come from uh, advancements in technology and things like that, any improvements in production that lead to improvements in income in a society are simply going to lead to population growth. And then that population growth is simply going to dilute the income gains so that over time, the average person is no better off and in fact may, be, may end up worse off, right? And so that was his argument is that basically population growth dilutes any improvements in production and income. The thing about Mal Malthus and why he deserves some praise is he was actually right about all of human history up until the point where he was writing and describing it. Um, and so some good work has been done uh, taking his writings and his model and kind of making it into um, a more explicit theoretical model. Uh, and we can show that it really works. Um, and that model really predicts most of human history prior to the Industrial Revolution. That's better than really any modern economic model can do at all. Um, so Malthus gets some credit for being possibly the most accurate economist ever, uh, but everything was starting to change at the time he was writing, right? Okay, so that's our early history, um, early, early history. Actually, that's most of history, right? And really no one had uh, a good living standard in terms of what we think of today. I, and Harry, yes, you're asking if there's a, a point of intersection. Absolutely. Um, the Malthusian model looks at an intersection basically between uh, birth rates and death rates that would imply a stable population. Um, and his argument, in short, is that if there's an increase in productivity, uh, that's going to end up increasing birth rates, which increase population, which then dilutes the average income. And then as the income changes and goes back down, that lowers the birth rate back down. Um, and so we get an intersection with basically a fixed level of average income. Um, historically speaking, I don't want to apply there was a fixed level of average income, but it varies in a rather small range, right? Um, maybe a little under $1,000 per person if we convert it to modern terms to maybe at the most approaching $4,000 per person, right? And so the richest societies before industrialization were maybe four times richer than the poorest societies. Um, and in the modern world, as we'll see, the gap uh, became much larger, although in some, to some degree it's closing now. Okay, so there are really two, two types of change uh, to talk about. The material driver, when we talk about economic growth and understanding what the Industrial Revolution was, it's all about technological change. Um, and the short answer to how we escaped the Malthusian trap is technological change that was much faster, uh, where the rate was faster and it could actually outpace the population growth. Um, but the key for actually improving people's lives is political change that actually came subsequently, although part, part of it came with it. Um, so I'm going to take a few minutes now and kind of give you all the short, <laughs> quite short version of how we got out of the Malthusian world. Um, and so one impetus was definitely technological change. Uh, we'll start with the age of exploration, which really followed uh, the plague in Europe. Um, and the noteworthy kind of starting point would be uh, when Portugal uh, expanded and actually um, took over Quetta in 1415 AD. And that's significant because Quetta is a very small area that's actually technically part of Africa. And so this marks the first time that a European nation state, this was a new thing, right? They consolidated power, basically, had, you know, became a nation state of Portugal, and then actually exerted that power to take over a different area, okay? Um, and yeah, the age of exploration sounds wonderful and great, like we're exploring the world. Um, we need to understand that that means further exploitation. 
that we're in a world here where in the first place the power dynamics are already brutal uh, and exploration was a further means of um, finding other areas to exploit in terms of resources and or in terms of, of people uh, with pretty a pretty shocking degree of brutality. Okay, so through Europe's response to the plague, right, we saw consolidation of nation states, not just in Portugal. And the short story there is um, because of the limited population, uh, you had a lot of um, feudal fiefs that were sustainable before the plague. And then, you know, they lost a third to half of their population and were no longer sustainable. And so they had to consolidate um, to survive. And that led to strengthening monarchies and strengthening nation states, right? Okay. And so Spain and Portugal were the early leaders here. Um, and their, excuse me, their monarchies, right, were first able to have a broader tax base and use that to fund exploration, right? And then the technology was developed to allow for greater, further exploration. Um, and the, the very, very brief version of that economically is they were successful in traveling to uh, the Americas and finding gold. Um, the irony of this to economists is, you know, this is what we call the theory of mercantilism, where their goal was to get the most gold, right? And they thought they would, um, you know, basically win, become the wealthiest and most powerful countries in the world by getting the most gold. And that reflects actually a, a very limited understanding of money and its value, because what that gold represented was really just an increase in their money supply. Um, and there are actually some good economic histories um, that measure this. They got inflation, um, and that's not something that was common in you know the pre-industrial world. Uh, it, it's exactly what happened was they actually just got higher inflation, which again is what an economist would tell you will happen if you increase the money supply without uh, productivity going up. And so what the gold actually did was it only helped. Spain and Portugal in the short term, but then they had inflation and they had higher prices. And that meant that uh, people in what we call the low countries, right, northern France, Belgium, Netherlands, uh, as well as the southern part of England, uh, they found a very appealing market in Spain and Portugal for imports. And so some craftspeople in those areas started making higher value products. And the key thing that came out of this, again, rather inadvertently, was development of early labor markets in parts of England and in the low countries there. Um, so that was kind of the first stage of this uh, age of exploration and what um, one of the authors I rely on here, uh, Emmanuel Wallerstein, he dubbed you know, the first world economy because there wasn't an empire here, right, dictating these different processes. You had different nation states Again, Spain and Portugal with the specific goal of winning at mercantilism, uh, inadvertently leading to development of some early labor markets in France and England. Now, again, I need to emphasize, you know, this sounds very exciting, right? And like, oh, we have markets developing and we actually have, you know, some laborers for, you know, one of the few times in history at this point, able to, able to actually make a high value product and get a fair price for it. Um, and that's emphasized precisely because it's very, very much the exception. Uh, the early Atlantic trade was extremely exploitative. Um, and so basically you had Spain and Portugal traveling and then uh, finding ways to exploit indigenous populations to extract the gold. And once the gold was gone, setting up plantations um, for sugar uh, initially, um, and then later on rubber and coffee and things like that. Um, and when they couldn't employ the indigenous populations because of um, a disease in a lot of cases that led to their um, demise very broadly, uh, they brought Africa into the trade and they started importing slaves um, so they could exploit their labor, right? And 
part of the reason this was so exploitative is because we're still in a world of very limited surplus, right? And so even the early plantations were not efficient in terms of production, um, but now we have, you know, the most exploitative power arrangements so that these European powers were able to extract a slight bit more surplus um, from slaves and other forms of exploited labor, okay? What that led to in Europe was some increase in productivity, and still in the Malthusian world, that led to population growth. We didn't get broader income growth. Uh, but the population growth did matter, right? And so, again, doing the very, very brief version, um, we had throughout a three to 400 year period, the development of, you know, first the intellectual development of some key concepts. Uh, the first one being the nation state, which, you know, kind of was established and started to be theorized more with Hobbes and then later Locke. Um, and then the rule of law came in, right, as these nation states were forming and philosophers started to imagine, you know, perhaps we should have a set of rules that everyone follows as opposed to doing what the ruler says. Um, and there was, you know, some back and forth there with this notion of absolute monarchy, right? We I mean, absolute is France, but that also brought about the idea of its opposite, right? A system of governance where there are constraints on the power of the executive, right? Um, and constraints on the ruler. Um, and we could trace some of that actually back to the glorious revolution in England and the establishment of parliament. Those are all important because it starts to lay out the groundwork for uh, what in institutional econom economics we call inclusive institutions. What we mean is political systems where there's some form of power sharing um, and where different groups are able to both wield power to some degree um, rather than having power completely concentrated um, in the hands of a, a single group, okay? So I would be remiss if I didn't highlight 1776. Uh, for the American Revolution, inspired by many of these ideals, as well as uh, the publication of The Wealth of Nations. Um, and that's really what I would focus on more for this, is the economic revolution. Um, and so what we had is those early labor markets in England had developed further. Um, and the part of Wealth of Nations that we highlight um, when I teach it is Adam Smith going to an early pin factory and just being amazed um, at the level of efficiency, the level of productive efficiency. And what that means if we return to the concept of surplus is that where previously in human history, right, people would only be able to produce maybe twice of what they needed to survive, the notion, uh, the development of factories here and technologies allowing for specialization of labor would allow an exponential increase in productivity and therefore in surplus. And so people were able to produce vastly more than what they were before. And so what happened in England was you had these labor markets develop. And interestingly, it was a combination of high wages along with cheap energy, coal that got it started, right? Um, that led for the development of energy intensive technology that also was key in this industrial revolution. Um, and so, it was a combination here of the political structures with some inclusive institutions, I'll talk about it more in a minute, uh, that allowed for the technological innovations that represented a rapid enough increase in productivity to get um, humanity out of the Malthusian trap, with England really being the first country to lead it. Okay, so it's really worth noting now the nature of, of capitalism. Because when people talk about it, um, there's a really common misconception that it's all about free markets and limited government. Um, and to show you how silly that is and how misleading, right, we've had free markets throughout human history. Um, and you can just go back to I mean, ancient Rome or really any area, right, that had producers and then they'd go to market. And those markets would largely be free, right? You'd have farmers breeding, bringing their uh, produce to sell, 
and trade, right? And it'd be some form of a bazaar or what today we think of as like a flea market, right? But you have lots of sellers coming in, right? Buyers know where to go. The market is a centralized place. Everybody comes in, they trade, they transact. Um, in terms of how we study markets, that's about as free as it gets. Uh, there are very few problems in terms of information. Um, depending on if they were big enough, if they're big enough, they're not likely to be monopolies. There's likely to be a fair bit of competition, right? So free markets existed for a long time before capitalism, okay? What really defined capitalism is the development of firms, uh, and firms as a way to organize and specialize workers. And that's actually not commonly understood, I think, um, and something we really want to emphasize, what I want to emphasize here. And the first thing to know, uh, yeah, Tom, go ahead. I see a hand up. Yes, uh, Dr. Farrell. <laughs> I see the question in the chat. It sounds like your, your volume's not working right. But yeah, firm the technical term. Uh, in short, yes. Um, so yeah, let me explain it in terms of the dynamics here, right? But basically, it would be, um, now we think of it as a company or a corporation, right? Um, but an organization that employs workers to actually produce something specific, right? And within those firms, you still have power dynamics as before, right? And I mentioned kind of three games, ways to, to lay that out. Uh, what's different is, you know, instead of it being a peasant farmer who has to answer, answer to a noble or, you know, a lord or whatever, right? You'd have people working, possibly, presumably by choice, right? But then submitting to uh, the expectations and the power of, you know, the capitalist boss, right? Whoever organizes the firm, sells the product, etc. So, okay, no problem. So what firms allowed for is much greater specialization. And as I mentioned, this is what Adam Smith was really focusing on in The Wealth of Nations, is he recognized that this was exponentially increasing people's productive capabilities, right? Because they could they could specialize. And whereas prior to this, people might produce twice what they needed, now they could produce 10 or 50 or 100 times uh, the value of what they needed basically to survive. Um, in terms of the power dynamic, well, yeah, I'll talk more about early firms. But the key part here is now there's a really a three-part dynamic because there's people slash workers, there's firms, and there's the government. Whereas it used to be just people and whatever um, government they had, which was some some form of uh, autocracy generally. Okay, so firms are the key development. That being said, uh, early firms were horrible. Um, the first factory workers were children. Uh, that's not because firms were nice, you know, kid-friendly places. It's because they were uh, they were more exploitable and they couldn't convince um, other people to work in firms, and so they basically found uh, you know orphan children and forced them into the factories first. Um, gradually, that shifted and workers moved into firms, and we need to ask why because they gave up what in a lot of ways seems better. Uh, agricultural work was more flexible. Um, you know, there are some time constraints based on the harvest, but not too many. Um, and you didn't really usually have a, a boss, right, you know, keeping you on task during the day. Uh, and the hours were certainly less. Um, and in early firms, the labor was completely monotonous and the hours were much, much, much longer. Uh, and the reason they did it was, as I mentioned before, these productivity increases have been slowly happening for one to 200 years, 
and that had led to population growth and that meant people didn't have better options and so we did have people migrating to the cities looking for some type of opportunity um, and early firms were what was it so what we see first is a ma major increase in productivity along with even more of uh, a growth in population wages did not start to increase really until the 1860s right uh, yes, Harry, thank you for that. Um, the jungle is a classic example. Um, what was it? Germinal uh, was one, another one describing, you know, workers' lives in um, this early stage of capitalism. And it was horrible. Um, and I should mention, so yeah, before I go jump to 1870, uh, I should mention Karl Marx, um, because what Marx was responding to, and in critiquing capitalism, he was responding to this early period, which did see clear increases in productivity and production, but really no benefits to workers, right? And so Marx just, Marx's description of the early capitalist economy was accurate, um, and he was right to highlight a lot of those problems. Uh, but what he didn't expect, or I guess where he, you know, was um, not nearly as accurate, is Marx just predicted that based on the power dynamics that the workers would just radically overthrow the firms, right, and that you would have worker-owned firms interacting with the government, right, or even becoming the government. And what we saw instead is um, gradual improvements in working standards, um, that workers started to have a better life within the system without radically overthrowing it, but the basic structure of having firms um, remained. So what we could tell um, by 1870, a couple of things. And the first is that capitalism was clearly fundamentally changing the world and it, and it was not a fad. Um, that has to be said because there were rulers, uh, even as late as the 1850s and 1860s, who resisted it um, and who thought it was. Um, and so we can see this in Austria-Hungary, um, the Ottoman Empire, Russia at that time under the czars. Um, they tried to resist. Um, they didn't want to build railroads. For instance, um, there's a great quote, um, I believe from a Russian uh, no voice up thing saying, you know, why on earth would people need to quickly get from one area to another? It can only, you know, lead to uh, unrest among the peasants or something like that, right? Um, and so there was definitely, there were nation states where people in power thought and hoped that capitalism was going to pass, right? Um, and that was clearly wrong, right? And so we had the Civil War in the U.S., which you could interpret as the more capitalist modern north fighting against the more traditionalist south uh, with their more exploitative uh, agricultural labor systems, right? Um, and then in Europe, uh, we saw Prussia um, have economic success uh, and then lead to German unification um, along with military success there. Um, and that Kind of gave a clear message to the nations of Europe that you know if you don't catch up in terms of the economics here, you're going to lose um, power in terms of the military. Um, and probably most notably, had Britain's rise as the first capitalist um, empire. And so we started then really in 1870, the age of imperialism. What I mean by a mix of new and old ideas is there's clearly a tension there. You have the new ideas of capitalism and greater production and greater capacity. Um, but with imperialism, you still have the old ideas that the most notable thing to do was achieve great conquest, right? And what would be remembered historically was a great empire, um, you know, and still kind of looking back as the Roman Empire, right, as the greatest in history and saying, well, who can, you know, who can today make a modern empire that compares, right? That doesn't really fit with how capitalism works well. Um, but I, I don't want to go into that too far now, except just to note that um, capitalism was based on 
this idea of a world economy I mentioned before, where countries trade and interact without an overarching power organizing it. Um, and that remained true. And what imperialism meant was within that, you had colonialism, you had uh, very exploitative arrangements within a British empire, within you know a French colonial empire, later a German colonial empire. Um, those relationships within the countries weren't really what we'd call capitalist, but then those empires traded with each other in a way that was. Um, the key part, I guess, for the story here is that things actually started to get better in some places for the average person. Um, and so we had uh, labor movements, um, especially in the US. We had movements against uh, market power. Um, and we actually start to see improvements in average wages for the first time, right? Um, okay, so Chris, I will wait a few minutes to get to your questions, but thanks for posting them, right? And so what I want to think about, I want to go back, I mentioned I would, right? We have kind of seven possibilities I pointed out earlier for a good society. Um, and by 1870, we can look back at this, right, and say what's possible or what was expected. So I don't know if you all want to take a minute, um, maybe put in the chat again, which ones of these do you think were achievable maybe in the United States or in England um, in this, you know, 1870 to maybe 1914 era. <laughs> so Chris, I'm reading your question and it's um, sounding to me like the basic notion of development economics where you have um, and agriculture or a traditional sector and you have a modern sector. Um, we'll come to that, I think. I don't know that we're to it quite yet. I'm not exactly in that framework. Um, okay. So uh, here I'm thinking in, you know, that early period, what, well, what was present? Yeah, because we'll turn more to what should have been present. Okay. So it could be you're excluding four, five, one, and seven. Okay, and maybe six. So yeah, it sounds like some agreement there. Um, interesting. Okay. So I'll talk a little bit about what was expected. Uh, and no, I'll just stable prices. Um, because in this time, uh, England, Great Britain was the leading economy, right? The leading empire in the world. Uh, and they kind of set the standard on a number of these. And England really started, um, well, it started, they committed formally to the gold standard, right? Uh, and the idea there was definitely stable prices, right? The idea was that a good country should back their currency with gold and keep that stable for as long as possible. There's some interesting historical background to that, um, and I think it came out of the notion historically that even a good king uh, or noble or lord, the pre-industrial era, should try to keep prices stable. The interesting thing is keeping prices stable was much easier in the pre-industrial era because the actual productive capacity of the economy wasn't increasing. Um, and so in the, what we had in the 1870s, really up to World War I, stable prices was an explicit goal, um, and it was sought through the gold standard. Uh, and countries failed to reach it. Um, most dramatically, I think, in the US, um, that led to the free silver movement, uh, William Jennings Bryan almost getting elected president uh, with the notion of backing the currency with silver as well as gold, 
and the whole economic reason for that was because the economy was growing faster than the money supply. And that actually led to deflation, which is actually very destabilizing in terms of the macroeconomy. Um, and that led to the political movement, which actually got the economics right of backing the currency with silver as well to stabilize uh, the prices. Um, and specifically help farmers uh, who had debt, and debt becomes harder and harder to pay off with deflation. So stable prices were a goal, um, but in terms of understanding how money supply works, uh, the leaders of the country aiming for that goal didn't reach it. Um, in fact, their mechanism for trying to get it was, in that sense, counterproductive. Okay, I think two uh, and three we can make a decent case for. We did start to see public goods, right? I mean, railroads was such a big part of uh, the Industrial Revolution, right? And that, um, in a sense, was public goods. And so we have property rights and contract enforcement. Those things were um, established in the leading economies, right? Along with uh, government funding for public goods. Full employment wasn't yet theorized as a concept that the government should pursue, um, which I'll say more about in a minute. And similarly with uh, economic stabilization. And then I don't think we could quite get to universal health care or universal basic income at this point. Um, and so where we are is, yeah, maybe two and three. Uh, and one was targeted, but not successfully, right? And so to, again, kind of once again, very, very quickly uh, go over some major eras in history. But we had this early capitalist period with strong economic growth, uh, with good labor mobility. We actually did see increases in average wages. Um, but those came along with lots of volatility. Uh, so era, in terms of business cycles and kind of the boom bust, it was much more uh, dramatic then, right, up and down. And that was because actually we had much less macroeconomic management. Um, what I didn't put here is the other story I alluded to earlier about imperialism being a mixture of new ideas and old. And I think the old notions there of glory through conquest and empire um, contributed in some part to World War I. But being a communist, I'm going to skip over the war part. Um, as we know, it didn't solve anything in terms of uh, conquest, and it was very destructive in terms of the toll on uh, human life and the countries involved. So we get the post-war period, um, and economically speaking, it was worse in a lot of ways. Uh, growth was weaker. Volatility ended up being larger, um, especially once the Great Depression really kicked in. Uh, and that led to the early attempts at macroeconomic management, which followed the works of John Maynard Keynes, who largely invented macroeconomics. And so the way I teach about macroeconomics now is that it's really a new field of study. Um, you know, maybe it's 90 years old at most. And if we, you know, want to pretend economics is a science, which it, it strives to be, right? 90 years is really young uh, to actually figure out um, how things work, right? But, but what we had is Keynes responding to the Great Depression. And you know, if we look back at our list, he's actually arguing for number five most directly, um, that the government can and should stabilize the economy when time gets, times get tough. Um, and that you know, leads into an argument for number four, uh, that full employment should actually be a goal. OK. So what I'm going to do again is kind of skip ahead because I want to get some feedback and ask you all some questions about our more uh, about the modern era, right? Um, so that's why you're getting such a rapid uh, macroeconomic history, right? But post World War II, um, in many ways, was so much better, uh, much stronger growth uh, worldwide, much greater stability, and this uh, followed through a more successful implementation of Keynes' ideas, uh, initially with fiscal policy, meaning using government spending and taxation to um, smooth out the business cycle. Uh, worth noting, in this period, this only happened in rich countries. 
colonies that then became free and then became developing countries uh, lacked the financial means often to do so and lacked the support uh, from international institutions to do so. Okay, um, so progress in some areas, areas there for sure, um, but the challenge, the economic challenge that kind of ended this first macroeconomic era uh, was inflation that got to be too high. Um, there's a lot more there that I'm going to kind of gloss over for the moment, uh, but it led to the neoliberal era, which is what I want to focus on now. Um, so I put 1980 to 2000XX. Let me explain that, um, especially because I said the earlier this era ended in 1973. There was a time there of 74 to 79 slash 80 um, where it's not clear how to best characterize uh, kind of the nature of the global economic system. Uh, it was clear that what we call the Bretton Woods system had broken down, um, and specifically there was a whole system of fixed exchange rates and uh, countries on the gold standard that had all ended uh, very unceremoniously in 1973. And then the leading uh, capitalist nations were responding to oil price shocks, uh, worried about population growth, worried about energy prices, um, and there was not a clear I don't think kind of ideological way forward until 1979-1980 with you know Reagan and Thatcher coming into power and kind of ushering in the neoliberal era. Um, and the basis of neoliberalism as we talk about it in economics is what we label the Washington consensus ideas of small government, free markets, um, supposed to be balanced budgets, right, uh, and economic efficiency. So the record is mixed. Um, what we do see is a dramatic improvement in economic stabilization efforts in rich countries up until 2008. So there's a period there we call the Great Moderation, where uh, the US and um, some of the European countries were able to have um, incredible stability in terms of the macro uh, economy with just a couple small recessions that were easily handled. Uh, but that kind of masks that in developing countries there was still massive volatility, um, various reasons for that. And also within these rich countries there was rising inequality. Um, and so my short summary of it at this point is neoliberalism put an overemphasis on the risks of government power. Uh, with the notion that you know small government was always the most effective solution. Uh, and it underestimated or emphasized the risks of market power. Um, and so if we kind of go back to this three-part power dynamic, right, between people and firms and the government, the neoliberal answer was, okay, limit the government, right, and just kind of assume that we're going to get a limited but effective government that will provide some public goods and get out of the way. And then just trust the market to constrain firms. Um, and that, I think, is probably its fatal flaw, because what we've seen is rising and rising inequality that's come along with rising market power uh, to the point that that market power threatens um, kind of the dynamism and the growth potential of capitalism itself. Right. So the other thing I'll note, I talked a little bit about neoliberalism there as if it's past. But that's not settled, right? I put 20XX um, because it's not clear yet what comes after neoliberalism. Um, it's not clear yet if we're all the way out of it or if this is a crisis that's then going to uh, evolve. But I think there's a pretty good case that we're in a crisis now. Um, I think there is there's some pretty good ideas in terms of economics of how to move forward. But I don't know that they're yet widely accepted, um, especially politically, in the way that kind of the Reagan and Thatcher revolution was in, in 1980. Um, so in terms of the current crisis, and back to our seven things, if we ask today what is possible 
I would argue that all of these are possible, and further that all of these are possible for every country in the world, which is a pretty strong claim. Um, but what's needed to get there is the political um, right movement, right? The political will to actually make this happen and really to address the economic concerns um, that came up or have come up more recently. So more specifically, uh, the developing world has to continue to catch up. That's already happening. I don't expect it to stop, um, but it's got to continue, right? So that people or uh, countries are working more from similar um, starting points. And then I'm going to argue and hope to make a strong case that you need some form of inclusive pluralistic governance. Um, effective representative democracy has been one of the best forms of that. It's not maybe the only form. Uh, but without that, we don't seem to get uh, the market outcomes that we want, um, or more broadly, the outcomes in terms of well-being. Uh, and I think there are really three broad categories of things that have to be addressed. And the first is this inequality and market power that's been accumulated in the uh, neoliberal period. The second is to address climate change, which represents a global externality that's going to require global organization to respond to. Um, and then what's maybe not as often stated, but I see is a problem almost on par with the first two, is the global financial instability. Um, if we tell the story of finances in the neoliberal era, uh, there's a little bit of a positive story of rich countries being stable for 25 years. But then we have the crisis of 2008. Um, and even in that period where rich countries were stable, developing countries were not stable financially. So I don't think we've figured out yet globally, uh, or I should say figured out, I don't think we've put in place yet globally the mechanisms for broader financial stability. So I really want to get some questions, comments, feedbacks on uh, this part. Uh, especially. So I'm going to stop there and open it up for that. Um, so yeah, Chris asking about if productivity growth is concentrated in a few big industries. Uh, hopefully that's simple to address, right? Um, I think we have the tools, theoretically and practically, to address market power. And it's the question of the political will to do so. Um, does that seem a fair answer, or is that too simplistic? <laughs> Sound like someone was speaking and I lost the thing. Yeah, everyone, feel free to turn on the mic and ask a question. Uh, Harry, I think you're having uh, issues with your audio. You might need to uh, uh, just reopen the the session. I'll stop sharing there so I can see people more if anybody wants to turn on a video. Uh, Chris, David Isco, what do you mean by uh, income redistribution would have to become more direct? So if all productivity growth is limited to three or four high tech industries, mm -hmm. right? and even if we try to break those up somehow, but the concentration of the return on investments just there. So what does society look like in that kind of a world? How does macro or, or fiscal policy address that where you have, you know, some very valuable high tech skills and tons of other useful skills, but they just, they're more service oriented where they, you don't get these large productivity growths. And so you don't get the natural market pressure on 
wage increases. And well, is a problem, I'm hearing two things, right? Is it a problem that the productivity growth is not as rapid? Or is a problem problem the market concentration, right? The market power. Right. Even even if it's not even if it's not concentrated, even if it's just even if you have say I don't know how it would not end up being concentrated. If those are if the return of capital is in some particular areas and there's some skill sets that have higher returns, right? But and then the and there but if it's just the capacity to hire people in those areas is limited as a share of your population. Right? So it, comparing that to earlier development where you had lots, anybody who built a factory and could apply capital right to workers had a big return on that investment and workers productivity went up and workers what you know the value marginal product of workers went so up. it's it's the barriers to entry you're worried about it sounds like right i'm not sure what it is i mean imagine i mean look at the world we have today where's most of our economic growth coming from and what is the effect on everybody who's not in those industries so yeah, well, let me address and try to address Harry's question as well. Um, and Harry, I'm glad you asked what you did because I really want to <laughs> address that one, right? Uh, so Harry mentioned the perspective that jobs are being lost to technology, right? Um, and the retraining isn't keeping up with it. They're kind of related, right? It's fun. They are related. related. Yeah, and the reason I'm glad you asked is this is something that um, we certainly hear a lot. And in fact, one of my students mentioned it this morning. Um, because I had given them a question about new technology, and they said, oh, yeah, well, that's going to lead to less employment. And the economic answer is actually the opposite. Um, the, what we'd expect to see is if you get greater productivity from new technology, there should actually be more demand for workers, because uh, workers, because firms can actually get more value from the workers. Um, and to give you some economist perspective on that, some long-term perspective, um, this is one of my favorite arguments to make, by the way. Uh, but if you go back to the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, these fears were there, right? Uh, the Luddites came about because they said, you know, oh, no, these factories are going to disrupt everybody's way of life and we're not going to have any work. And, you know, some of them were so radical as to, like, try to destroy the factories, right? But what we've seen in the industrial era, right, in the past 200 years, is um, the fastest technological advancement in human history that led to the fastest population growth in human history. And yet, in a modern economy, it's reasonable to expect 95% of people who want to work will have a job, which means we've also created more jobs than have ever been there before. So I actually think we have an unlimited capability to create jobs. The question is whether those jobs are worthwhile, whether those jobs mean something, whether those jobs are necessary. And so I'd argue that a lot of modern jobs aren't necessary really at all. Um, but there's really, we don't seem to have a problem making up things for people to do in a sense, right? Um, but, but, but will incomes keep up then, right? I mean, 90% so, of jobs are not in these high paying industries. I would say, I'm gonna take it back to the power dynamics, right? Um, and one of the fundamental problems in the modern era is that real wages have not grown even though productivity has. And the best explanation I have for that goes back to market power and that workers don't haven't had enough, right? Uh, and the firms have too much. Um, and so basically if we have some notion of a modern labor movement um, that helps workers regain some of that market power and push for higher wages, then it should come back. And we're seeing some of that with movements for, for instance, a $15 minimum wage. Um, and I saw recently actually economists have come around where that used to be something that most economists were pretty skeptical of. Um, 
I think if I'm remembering correctly, a majority of economists now support a uh, $15 minimum wage, um, which is pretty interesting because while I actually support it in practice, especially in Florida, it's not, <laughs> yeah, it came around, it's not my first choice, right, if I were trying to, you know, trying to improve the U.S. economy, right? That wouldn't be where I went first, but uh, it really seems maybe one of the simpler ways to try to improve things um, for workers who, again, have seen their market power eroded, I think, far too much in the past uh, 40 or 50 years. Now, I guess to be fair, uh, to Harry's question, um, there may be some degree of luck. And so one of the um, sources I rely on a lot is an economic historian named Gregory Clark. And he basically says, we got lucky that the types of innovations that drove the Industrial Revolution um, ended up helping workers. But basically, we got lucky. And you can have technological change that doesn't necessarily. Um, and I would go back to that's why the that's why there's democracy in the title, right? It comes back to the political question and the power dynamics to ensure that they do. So uh, I want to ask one question of my uh, fellow economists, especially, and then, uh, you know, Chris and Harry is, is not economist. Um, what would you think of this? in more detail, but as a, as a book for an introductory economic history course. Is it a sensible argument? Does it work? Or is it, do the things good, bad, missing? OK, how does it fit with the return on capital books that we're seeing now? What do you mean return on capital books? Like, oh, come on, there's a famous Deacon. author's name that sh escaped me as soon as I turned on my mic. Um, <laughs> do you mean Deacon's capital? I'm sorry. Yes, Deacon. right? Yeah. Right? So it's, um, Piketty's definitely informs part of it, um, but I think more the modern part, and I think it's only part, right? So Piketty's focused on inequality. Um, and he presents an argument that I definitely will include more explicitly in the book, or plan to, um, which is that capitalism kind of by default leads to increasing inequality, that it's just the nature of capitalism, right? I think that's a really fascinating argument. Um, and, you know, therefore you need more, um, you have to have basically government intervention to balance that out, right? So that's part of it. Um, the Piketty, I think, is focused on that one question and isn't really accessible to an introductory undergraduate audience um, very broadly. I mean, we was, we assign one chapter from Piketty, but that's enough. The main book is very dense and very right. data oriented. Yeah. Thanks, Harry. I see your comment there. OK. Yeah, because I'm intrigued on the application. So I'm thinking, I'm trying to go way back at the very first steps, right? You know, who owned all the capital and what did they use it for? And it was mostly nobility, and they mostly used it in agriculture, right? Yeah. And so the right. change with firms was a, a new application for saved resources. Right. Okay. And then and the there question is, Go ahead. Yeah, no, there's a dynamic that I didn't go into here, but between you know old money and new money, right, as the Industrial Revolution gets going. Um, hmm, okay. So, and then the question is, where did the workers come from? What was the pool of workers? And so part of what I'm hearing you saying is the pool got bigger, yeah. and so the excess got siphoned into manufacturing without much of a change in wages. But I'm thinking, well, first, wouldn't you see wages or incomes going down in agriculture, right, during that transition? And then they kind of go back up 
when you have the manufacturing outlet, so they kind of even out or what? And if, if workers aren't getting paid more, then is their capital really accumulating super fast in this period? Where's all the productivity gains going? Sure. So I would say in the early period, like 1800 to 1860 period, right? You had the labor pool expanding just by population growth. Um, and that that's actually where a lot of the gains were going were just towards <laughs> feeding and housing and whatever more okay. people. Um, and that it didn't, I think, have a huge impact on wages in agriculture, but they were probably both similar, right? It was just that too many people to farmland in a certain area, they moved to the cities, they get sucked into factories, right? Um, but I hear for you kind of again the basic development theory, right? If you have a modern sector and an agricultural traditional sector, right? Uh, and what we expect there is the higher wages in the modern sector lead some people to move into that, but that actually ends up supporting higher wages in agriculture also, right? Mm -hmm. um, Harry, I love your other comment uh, because you're right. In some sense, it would have to be altruistic. Um, we should never expect businesses to just be altruistic, right? That's not why they exist. Um, so the question is, to me, can we create some incentives and the systems or things, right, to support that a little better? Thank you, Chris. That is very helpful. Um, I see we're past time, so I don't